following is a conversation with Dr. Alan Walker, a senior lecturer at the Rowett Institute for Nutrition and Health at the University of Aberdeen. Dr. Walker has been working in the microbiome field for the last 20 years, and over the course of this episode, he shared with us some of his insights into how the field has developed, how new technologies have improved our understanding of the microbiome, and we also spent a lot of time having some fun debates about pros and cons, some of the benefits associated with microbiome modulating therapy, and also where some of the myths and misconceptions lie. So for the generalist who wants to learn more about the microbiome, I think this is an excellent episode. We also get pretty deep and pretty technical in some areas, like for example, microbiome sequencing, next generation probiotics, can the microbiome cause obesity or be contributing to obesity? There's tons in here. And we go right the way across the microbiome field, talking about diagnostics, at-home microbiome testing, the use of fecal microbiota transplantation, what is a healthy microbiome? So absolutely fantastic, lots in here. And because Alan's been a friend and a collaborator for, gosh, maybe seven, possibly longer now, years now, uh, we've got a really nice dynamic over the course of this conversation. We push each other. We have strong debates. It's not in any way, shape or form confrontational. It's two friends having a really fun, in-depth discussion about the microbiome. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm really appreciating all the feedback you've been giving the podcast as well. As I came into the podcast studio today, apparently one of the listeners had been asking uh, if they could be connected to me. So thank you so much. Please just reach out on socials. Um, this will be the last podcast that I've recorded in 2023, so I wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of the listeners and supporters of the podcast for everything you've done to help us build the, the name, the brand, and to get the message out there around microbiome being critically important and gut health being really important for wider body health. Please reach out on socials or at james at insidematters.health if you'd like to connect and have any discussions about the microbiome. This is Inside Matters. My name is Dr. James McElroy. I hope you enjoy it. So when I first met you, I was a young man. Mm, still are. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's feeling less and less like that, I have to say. There's some grey hairs coming. That's how life goes. Yeah. And, I, and I'm now strategically using a photo <laughs> from a year and a half ago in my presentation conclusion. So there you go. That just tells you things are... Uh, well, academics use photos <clears throat> 30 years ago, so you're... <laughs> but, but back then, the microbiome was a thing that people were aware of. Mm -hmm. But there certainly wasn't the same kind of interest in gut health and yeah. so on. You feel the same? Yeah, you know, I think probably over a slightly longer time frame, I guess. So, because um, I've, I've been working in this area since I think about 2002, so just over 20 years now. So, yeah, if you don't feel like a young man, I definitely don't. Um, and yeah, I know um, when I first started, it really was kind of like a cottage industry for science. There was maybe one paper a month came out, and that would be on any gut microbiomes, you know, cows or chickens. But whoa, there's a paper out this month. Um, and, you know, last year I checked, it's over a thousand every month. Wow. So, you know, so it's really sort of snowballed massively over that 20 year period. I like to give my person the responsible for it, but sadly, <laughs> no. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, you know, it's been, um, there has been this sort of constant exponential growth in the field, you know, ever since sort of the mid 2000s, really. And how do you keep up to date as someone who's... <laughs> immersed in this because you can't read a thousand papers a month no no you can't so i mean the honest answer is no one can keep up to date so you know um you, know, you absorb knowledge through basic reading listening to people going to talks going to lectures uh, but you know you'll always miss stuff unfortunately in the field but um yeah no so it's i mean it's a very different like i say um area than when i started before you kind of felt that you could absorb everything and you learned everything in the field mm. um nowadays yeah you, you you pick out the landmark papers and you know you, you find stuff that's interesting but no it's it's a lot more difficult to keep up now can you try and summarize what the field has learned yeah. over the last 20 years in yeah. sort of big picture terms you know what i find most interesting is that actually if you think big picture terms um we knew quite a lot of this stuff already <laughs> 20 30 40 years ago so if you read sort of reviews from the 1970s about the gut microbiota. There's lots of stuff in there which is still 100% accurate, you know, about the importance of short chain fatty acids for health, you know, the breaking down of fiber. A lot of this stuff is already known. I think one of the myths in the field is that, you know, that microbiome is a new field. And it really isn't, you know, it goes back over 100 years. Um, you know, E. coli was first discovered in the late 1800s. Bifidobacteria, these really beneficial bacteria from babies also discovered in the late 1800s. So, you know, the field has quite a long, rich history going back. 
it's just, as I say, it's just really exponentially grown over the last 20 or so. And I think people have lost sight a little bit, actually. Wow. Of, you know, there was a lot of received knowledge already um, before the field took off. And I think sometimes we do a disservice to all that really brilliant research that was done, you know, all the way back to Pasteur and all the sort of people back then in the 1800s. So, so maybe we can kind of summarize it with the question, why is the microbiome important? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a question that we're all asking in the field, I guess. Uh, I think... I think there's, there's multiple answers to this question, but so I'll try and hit it by layers. I think the thing I try and get across to students and, and people I talk to in public engagement is this is a microbial planet, right? You know, microbes were here billions of years before we were, right? And so anything that's evolved into this world has had to do so in the presence of microbes, okay? And so, you know, we as human beings did not appear in the world in a vacuum. We have to deal with these microbes. They were here first. It's their planet. And so as our biology, our biology has evolved, our bodies have evolved over time, we've had to evolve to deal with these microbes. Over time, we have selected ones which aren't going to kill us off and they've selected us. You know, if you're a, if you're a microbe, you know, if you kill off your, uh, your host, you've got to go and find a new one. You know, it makes right. sense to have a host that, you know, you can live in relative sort of peace and harmony with. Um, it's a stable place to live. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice environment for bacteria. It always kind of blows my mind that across the entire world, places a bacterium can choose to live. Um, up your backside is one of the favorite places <laughs> they have. Um, you have some of the highest density microbial communities are inside our bodies. Right. Well, and the reason for that is in it's the whole a warm, planet, in the yeah, whole planet, anywhere, right? You know, in the universe. Yeah, any, well, in the universe, who knows? I've not, I've not sampled <laughs> in the universe, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know, if you think about it logically, it's from a bacterial point of view, it's a very nice place to live. It's a stable environment. The temperature doesn't change. It's not like being out in the soil somewhere when you go through the frosts. Um, you know, you get a relatively constant supply of food and nutrients. Right. So from a bacterial point of view, actually, it's an amazing place to set up home. Just it's, it's poo. <laughs> so from our <laughs> point of view, it seems weird. But from a bacterial point of view, it is actually, you know, a remarkably stable and welcoming place to be if you're that kind of a bug. So, so I mean, yeah, so as I said, to go back to your question, how important for health is, you know, it, they're fundamental to our physiology, our, the way we are as human beings, right? So um, I don't think it's a surprise then that these, these creatures, that we share a world with, um, have played an important part in our in, in the way we that we function as human beings. So, you know that that can range from protecting us from pathogens. And we know that if you if you give say mice um, antibiotics to wipe out their microbiota, they become a hundred thousand fold more susceptible to, wow. to infectious disease. You know you can knock out bits of their immune systems, and you don't have that level of you know reduction in protection. Wow. So they're hugely important for protecting us from some of the nasty germs. Um, you know, they help us break down fibers and things that, you know, otherwise we would poop straight out because we don't have the enzymes to break those down. They train, they teach our immune system, they keep us primed um, and a whole host of other things, which we're only just learning, you know, the more and more research is mm. done. So fundamentally important for our health. Um, I have to say there's a flip side to that. So germ-free mice, the mice that you grow in a lab, they live longer. Not shorter life. They live longer. They do live longer. I thought yeah. they lived shorter. No, they live longer. Yeah. And but so, how do they live? Do they well, live better? So, or so they're in a bubble. So they're never exposed to microbes. And so their immune system is underdeveloped, so they don't have to waste so much of their energy, you know, having an immune system, for example. Um, you know, that would suggest that overall the net effect is that, you know, microbes actually are not the beneficial thing we all talk about. But wow. that is in a little bubble which does not reflect reality in the world. Like I say, that in that little bubble these mice grow in is not like the world. We're on a microbial planet. They are not. So, so, so the saying, world we're in, <clears throat> yeah. the microbes are hugely important for us. I had always thought that these germ-free animals mm. lived less long. No, no, they live longer. Yeah, that goes back decades, that, that finding was first discovered. But if you move them from mm -hmm. their germ-free environment into... Oh, yeah, then they're in deep trouble. Then yeah. they're done. No, they're, they're really... Because their immune system hasn't developed to deal with this microbial world, like I say, that we all live in. They have underdeveloped um, immunology, and so they really don't know how to deal with uh, with microbes when they hit them. So, so like I say, it, within that bubble... No, right. that would suggest that overall, if you lived in a magical world without microbes in it, then we would live longer, happier lives wow. potentially. But the world we're in, that's not that world, right? We don't live in that bubble. So Just for a couple us, of the thought experiments, maybe. Yeah, in, in, yeah sure. In that vein. Yeah. I mean, this is really hypothetical now. Yeah. But it, but can these mice actually digest and break down, you know, yeah. so, fibers? So the answer is no, they don't. They have to consume more to get the same amount of energy because they don't have the microbes to break down the fiber. Um, they actually have to supplement their diet with the, v, the B and K vitamins that their microbes would normally provide them with. So, right. so no, they are, they are missing things. Because obviously those mice didn't evolve in that bubble either. They evolved in a microbial world too. So actually what you're putting them in is a very unnatural environment yeah. for them. So no. And, and to bring it back to what you said at the very start, this is a microbial world. It is, yeah. So translationally, it's 
not really that relevant in the no, experiment, no, I suppose. Exactly but it's it's an interesting. It's just an interesting observation. An interesting you know, talk about idea. microbes being so good for us, but you know, actually, <laughs> if we lived in a world without them, we might actually do better. So, so how does the how does the microbiome develop then over time? Yeah. Um, so I mean, for me, the most interesting thing about the microbiome is the complete randomness of it. Right. So every single person on this planet has a different microbiome. Right. Think of it as your own smelly fingerprint. Right. And so we know a little bit how that comes together. You know, some of it is down to host genetics, but actually a very small proportion. You know, we're talking less than 10 percent is explained by your genes. Um, you know, some of it is um, what we eat, you know, um, and in babies, what we eat is super important to that microbiome developing. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but really, a lot of it seems to be just what you're exposed to. Right. So right. Um, so when a baby is first born, it comes out, um, if it's born through the vaginal tract, that's the first microbes it's exposed to. Some of the bugs from there will get in. Anyone who's been at a birth will know it's quite a messy process. I've delivered there's, a baby. There's poo there. There's, yeah, yeah it's bad. messy. Yeah. Great, so yeah. th those bugs are the first bugs that get into the baby, right? If they're yeah. C-section, slightly different. Ones that come from the skin, come from the surgeons operating, slightly different. However, within a very, very short period of time, talking days, those are replaced. Um, and that really is driven by uh, what the baby eats. So if the baby is breastfed, you get lots of these bifidobacteria that people may have heard of. They're in sort of probiotic -y type drinks. Uh, and generally are thought of as quite benign, quite helpful bacteria, I guess, and um, may actually help the baby's immune system to develop and train them on a slightly less aggressive set of bacteria. Um, if you're not breastfed, if you're formula fed, um, you have some bifidobacteria still, but other types of bacteria also tend to come in as well, um, a bit more of a diverse community. Um, and then after weaning, you get this big expansion in the diversity of the microbiota as we start consuming different fibers and providing different energy sources for the microbes that live there. So that process goes on for the first few years of life. And then once you get to sort of adolescence, adulthood, it's relatively stable over time. So we can go back to donors we've had for years and years and years, and I know which donor is which by their microbiota profile. I mean, oh, really? It fluctuates a little, whether you had Weetabix for breakfast or, you know, yogurt, whatever. But overall, the types of bugs that are in there are relatively stable over decades and decades. Um, and that process of how you end up with that stable community is still not fully understood. And a lot of it does seem to be just what you're exposed to. Mm. Now, you can have identical twins in the same house, the same diet, exposed to the same bugs, and they still end up with a unique microbiota. Okay, it's more similar than two random people that have never met before, so there is some sharing. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a fascinating process. We don't fully understand, but in the end, everyone ends up with this sort of unique mm. configuration of microbes, which is interesting, but makes this research field so difficult to study, and we'll come into that, I guess, later on, maybe. What impacts the microbiome, like, yeah. in a big way, yeah. and... Do people always revert back to what you're describing as that like yeah. stable you yeah. call it a core microbiome? Is that yeah. what the field use? Yeah, I guess core or yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess that's probably a fair word for it. Yeah. Um so the interesting thing is that you can really perturb the microbiota. You take antibiotics, for example. Um but the really interesting thing is unless you're repeatedly hit with antibiotics over and over and over again, like someone who's in a hospital environment, um, your microbiota largely will grow back over a few weeks. Now, not entirely, but mostly it bounces back. It's quite resilient. Mm. And to me, that's the most interesting thing, right? You know, there's there, there's obviously some left over behind. They've set up home with your immune system. Your immune system recognizes these bugs and you tolerate each other. And it goes back to that sort of steady state, you know. Um, Again, you change your diet, you can have some effect on your microbiota, but if you go back to your old diet, your microbiota will snap right back as well. So, you know, when we talk about changing your microbiota by diet, I think it's a lot of um, easy cells in the field, you know, here, try this one, right. your diet. Right. But, you know, great, but as soon as you go back to your old diet, so if you want to change your microbiota for life, you probably have to change your, your, your diet for life, yeah. which is a much harder sell. <laughs> you know, do this for a couple of weeks and you'll be fine. Or take a product that contains a full spectrum of microorganisms once every few months. Yeah. But Not you, saying that that's yeah. what we should do. No, right? no, but will they colonize? Yes or no. And, you know, a lot of those bugs won't colonize. As soon as you stop taking the product, they're gone, you know. And so I think this has been a um, an issue in the probiotic field for a long time is, you know, as soon as you stop taking the probiotic, they're right. gone. You know, I told you that your microbiota protects you from invading pathogens. It also stops mm. potential nice guys from colonizing too. They've got their house, it's their, it's their place, mm -hmm. get out. And so, you know, um, some will stick around. You know, you do pick up bugs as you age and go through life. You pick up from the environment here and there, but it's a much slower process than when you were really young. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, it's tough. You know, mm -hmm. it's really tough to predictably and reproducibly alter a microbiome. And I guess maybe we'll come back we to will. later. But yeah. It brings me, though, to, a, I think, a question that hopefully an expert like you should find very easy to answer, which is, 
what is a healthy microbiome? <laughs> you know, this is a good question. I get asked <laughs> this quite a lot. What is a healthy microbiome? And you know, um, given that everyone has a different microbiome, you know, everyone, has, everyone in this room here, you, me, we all have a different microbes. The answer I always give is one that doesn't make you sick. You know? Interesting. You, you asked me to define what is a healthy microbiome, what does it look like? There's such a spectrum in people and what their microbiome looks like, especially down at the species and strain level, you know. Um, it's, it's um, you know, if it's making you happy, healthy, you're not sick, then for you, that's probably a healthy microbiome, you know. Beyond that, though, could you go a bit deeper in terms of you know, constituents, functions, presence, absence? No, no. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. I think people will tell you they can. I, I don't believe you can. I think, you know, there are certain key functions like short chain fatty acid production, whatever yeah. these microbes, fine, everyone knows these things are good for you. Mm. But, you know, lots of different microbes make short chain fatty acids. Um, I would argue that, you know, having a decent amount of butyrate producers, butyrate being one of the short chain fatty acids, mm. is probably a good thing on balance. Sure. Um, other people would argue that butyrate can be bad for you, you know, because it has sort of uh, effects on, um, on, on whole cells. So it's... It, Genuinely, you were, uh, we're having a debate here where there isn't a consensus, and yeah. there isn't a consensus for a reason, right? which is that the microbiome is so complex and has varied so much between people mm. that actually it's been very, very difficult to say, look, if that person has this microbiome configuration, they're definitely not well. If this person has this, they're definitely fine. Mm. Um, and it's just been very, very difficult to get to that stage. But we've identified across a large number of what I'll call kind of case control studies. Mm -hmm that there are distinct differences between people who have disease and people who are quote unquote healthy. So I'm going to put a question back to you. What do you mean by distinct? <laughs> distinct. <laughs> so what I observe, mm -hmm. what I've seen a lot of, mm -hmm. is most notably and most consistently reductions in diversity mm -hmm. defined by the ecological indices, yep. Shannon, inverse Simpson, all the but things that you At what point be... does that become diagnostic? Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll get to that. And I like, I'm being interviewed now, you're testing, yeah, testing me, testing me. <laughs> I see very frequently differences in relative abundance mm -hmm. in particular genuses. Yep. So for example, yep. proteobacteria. So I agree, if you have a, that's the one thing I would say, you know, diversity, I mean, that, that fluctuates. You know, if we have a lot of studies, for example, where we feed dietary fiber to people and diversity goes down, not up. Yeah. Right? And you know, Why? How? Well, I'll tell you why. So, you know, if, if you say you fed resistant starch, okay, I think you talked about this with Harry Flint when he was on Ruminococcus bromii is a great resistant starch to greater, right? So yeah. if you if you have Ruminococcus bromei in your gut, that will likely respond to eating lots of starch, right? right. So it okay. will go up. Okay, I got and So it becomes 25% of your microbiota, so everything else drops. So your diversity score goes down because this one bug has mm. taken over, right? So diversity being high always equals good. You know, it's 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 one of these, I guess what, what if you talk to me, the one thing that hopefully comes across is that, you know, in the microbiota space, simple statements are very rarely always true. Mm. You always need that nuance with microbiota. Mm. So usually, yes, a higher diversity is associated with health, but in and of itself, it doesn't mean you're definitely healthy. I, I got you. No, yeah. I, I I fully agree with that. But uh, just the proteobacteria point is a good point. I think, yeah, proteobacteria, Yantrobacteriaceae type opportunistic pathogen type bugs, them sneaking up in abundance, yeah. it's probably not a good thing, right? But there are people who are ostensibly healthy walking around who have, say, 5 10%, and they seem to be all right, you know? Now, you know, again, it's not at a point where if you're trying to talk about the microbiome as a, as a clinical um, feature, where you can go, right, you've got this profile, you've definitely got disease X, we need to treat you with treatment Y. Mm. You know, and I don't think you will ever get that level of precision for any disease in microbiome, I'll be honest. Let's debate that. I'll, I'll just share some more insights because I, I think I have a bit of an unfair advantage here insofar mm -hmm. as we profile, I think, more healthy stool samples than maybe anyone yeah, else. Sure. Potentially in the world now, yeah, actually, yeah, with open yeah, biome season yeah, to exist, yeah, which is, yeah. I think is pretty cool. Yeah, no, yeah. And without delving into anything that's, you know, uh, commercially confidential mm -hmm. or, or strictly proprietary yeah. or a trade secret, we do see some fascinating trends, like, and, 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 and consistent so, trends. I'm going to call you on trend. Okay. Trend. Okay. <laughs> we, 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 we see some uh, consistent findings mm -hmm. across all the people who filter through our process, which arrives at a cohort who are healthy. So, so without giving too much away, mm -hmm. diversity is consistently higher yep. on these indices yep. than people we've sampled elsewhere. Yep. The proteobacteria thing mm -hmm. is consistent insofar as we see less than 5% relative abundance yep. pretty much every single time. Yep. Yep. The fascinating thing though, mm -hmm. is we do see transient carriage mm -hmm. of certain things. Yep. They appear and they disappear. Yeah. 
And again, I can't go into too much detail, but <laughs> <laughs> I think in people who are unhealthy, yeah. this transient carriage of pathogens or yeah. pathobians, can you call them that? Is that a word that I we like? I call them opportunistic pathogens, but yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in someone who's maybe not healthy, who maybe has reduced diversity, mm -hmm. they can somehow find a way to kind of stick around. So I think, and they, and like I say, like, I'm not here to be a contrarian. I really don't like contrarians, honestly. It's, uh, contrarianism has gone crazy over the last couple of decades. People just say things just for the sake of it. Yeah. I think there's what you're saying there, has, there's definitely merit in it, right? You know, absolutely. Um, it's well established now across a range of disease conditions. Diversity tends to be down. Yeah. Enterobacteriaceae tends to go up. Um, now, I would ask the question, is that a cause or result of the disease? And I don't think we're That's a tough one. There. Yeah. You know, if you have inflammation in your body, inflammation will dampen down the growth of many of the beneficial bugs in your gut. They're more sensitive to it than things like enterobacteriaceae. And it may just be you've wiped everything else in a little bit and enterobacteriaceae takes its chance. Right. Now, I do think there is potentially you get this sort of negative feedback loop because they are a little more pro-inflammatory, these enterobacteriaceae. So I can see how you get in a situation whereby these do a little better because of inflammation. They trigger more inflammation, which means that good bugs never come back to the same level. And so yep. I do think things like that are probably having a role to play Absolutely. in things like inflammatory bowel diseases. I, I, I'm not going to argue yep. that point whatsoever. Whether you can take that situation as a diagnostic and say this person X definitely has disease Y, yeah. That's what, with the level of precision required for clinical practice. That's where I that think re that so. remains to be determined. I'll just say yeah. one more one more thing. I, I think somebody somewhere in the world, and if yeah. if you're listening and you've got the ability to do this, please do it. I hope will show somehow mm. through one of these prospective longitudinal studies that you do get a proteobacteria bloom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before the that onset. The onset. Yeah. yeah, that would be so cool. Now but I agree. Why it's bloomed? Yeah, yeah. we don't know. Yeah, but that yeah. would be yeah. awesome. I mean, honestly, I agree. I think absolutely. I think longitudinal studies, given the variation in individuals, following people long term, so they almost like act like their own control. Yeah, that is the way forward for the field. Because absolutely. if you take a group of people X, group of people Y, and just compare them, you will find differences in the microbiome 100%. just by random chance. It's these longitudinal studies that you're talking about, where you actually get a sort of preceding event that will hopefully lead you to something that's a bit more concrete. Yep. So, and the field is doing that. To be fair, I think for ten years, a lot of people just, you know sampled did the a bunch of controls. people and went look i did this you know everyone did it right it's, it's what was done the, the technology was new it was the first thing to do was just look can we see disease xyz do they have right. different microbiome but actually that correlation is is not necessarily meaningful and i think the field as a whole needs to move from correlations yeah. into mechanisms and actual consistent patterns mm. that you know come across the whole repeated study sets mm. at the start we talked about the kind of two decades you've had in the field mm -hmm. and what's changed over time and what mm -hmm. we've learned. Yeah. That seems to be quite an interesting trend. It might be worth just unpacking a little bit, the, the correlation thing moving to yeah. causation. What, what what does that mean? So, so I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, the biggest shift was the technology-driven change, you know. So the field, um, and I was actually really fortunate in this respect. So um, I was working at the Wellcome Sanger Institute, which is down in Cambridge, um, and that is a sequencing centre. It does lots of DNA sequencing. And so I just happened to be there doing my postdoc work at the time when all these new next generation sequencing mm -hmm. technologies were invented. It's one point of clarification. Mm -hmm. Was that originally invented for human DNA? Uh, for any kind of DNA sequencing. So yeah, so, it's, right. so I mean, yeah. Um, so obviously DNA is in everything, <laughs> everyone. Um, and so anyone who's interested in the biology of an organism can sequence their DNA and, and learn more. So um, so these new techniques, basically, I mean, I cannot get across, you know, I guess as a non, to a non-scientist who might be listening, how exciting that was. So I mean, right. I, I'll, try, I'll, try and, I'll try and put it into context for please, you, right? Yeah, so, so obviously, so I, like I say, when I did my PhD, um, you know, at that time, maybe there was like a few dozen bacterial genomes in the world existed, a very small number, right? right. And they took probably around about half a million pounds each, just under maybe, wow. and years to do, right? Wow. I, I, wow. It was like, you know, one genome was a massive big deal, right? right? And I think at that time when I finished my PhD, there was maybe two or three, three, four gut bugs, E. coli, uh, Bacteroides fragilis, and, um, and a bifid had their genome sequenced. And that was it. Right. That was the that was entirety it. of the that collective yeah. that global was knowledge. Yeah. Um, wow. And then within two years, the cost went from about half a million pounds in years to do it to 40 pounds in days. Wow. Right? And so I cannot explain to you how much that changes the rules of biology and what you can do as a scientist. Experiments that were literally impossible three years ago are now just routine and easy. And so the excitement of being in that institute at that time, a sequencing center set up to sequence DNA when this revolution happened, generally as a privilege, 
absolute privilege. So, That's awesome. Um, so I think, you know, as a field, awesome. these technologies, people jumped on them, right? You know, it's, these are amazing. We can do things we never did before. And so as a field, the first thing we all did, sequence lots of stuff and see what was there we never grew in the lab before because it's hard to do, right? And then you kind of hit the brick wall of, okay, so I've got correlation of this with this. It's actually meaningful. Mm. And, you know, people would repeat these studies and actually they didn't repeat very well. Different bugs were popping up that didn't pop up in your study. Reproducibility is poor as a whole in this sort of study for the field. And so I think the interesting thing for me being in the field for this length of time is that there was this big rush to the sequencing technologies. And mm. I did it perfectly sensible. But now there's a gradual, well, maybe we need to go back to the lab and do some experiments again and actually work with the bugs and get to mechanisms. Mm. And for me, the combination of the two, the high throughput, new modern sequencing methods yep. in combination with actual mechanistic stuff in the lab is what's going to get us to these sort of situations, hopefully, that you're yeah. talking hopefully. about. Hopefully. And how much further has the sequencing gone in terms of technology? Like, what does it cost now? How fast to turn around? You know, I mean, I see, I mean, there was a big dramatic drop off and it's kind of, it's not been quite as dramatic for say, 10 years now, but it's still, I mean, honestly, if you want to profile someone's microbiota now, it's it's cheaper just to do the sequencing than do the DNA extraction and the PCR steps involved. So it's, really? you know, it's, it's like 10 quid to get someone's 16S profile done. It's really cheap. So wow, it costs more to do the extraction in the PCR. Can we talk ab about the sort of analytical toolkit that we mm -hmm. have? Yeah, so, yeah. So, so you're, you're working in, in the space. Actually, maybe just talk about your research objectives first, mm -hmm. then we can talk about the analytical toolkit. Okay, that, sure. I think that's quite cool. Uh, so yeah, I've got fingers in many pies. <laughs> so uh, I guess ultimately I'm really interested in functions of microbiota that have relevance for health. So um, we do a lot of work um, on trying to identify species that are most likely to kill off pathogens mm. in both humans and animals. And so can we harness those to try and reduce carriage of, say, salmonella in chickens? If they've got a strong, robust microbiota that kicks these pathogens out, they don't get sick. And then when we eat them, we don't obviously pick up salmonella from them either. So trying to reduce carriage of pathogens is a major aspect of what we do. And we've found lots of nice um, bugs, which at least in the lab, will knock out these pathogens very nicely. It's whether they do them in the animal is and the next phase. You, you will feed them to the chickens? That would be the aim eventually, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we might touch on this later if we're going to talk about probiotics, but... Um, we will. Yeah, it's it's yeah. easier said than done, unfortunately, with these some of these bugs. Um, yeah, so we do that. Uh, very interested in the impact of diet on the microbiota, you know, so uh, the Route Institute where I'm based in Aberdeen for years has done lots of really nice work showing how different types of fibre will promote different types of microbes. So I think we have a decent handle now. Let's say, like I say, if you eat starch and you've got Ruminococcus bromae and you're gone, mm. that will go up. What we've got less of a handle on is what is the impact of that on the host. Mm. So what does that bug do then? Is it a good thing that this bug mm. goes up or is it not? And so I, for me, I'm really interested in trying to get mm. towards functionality of some of these bugs and working out you know, which are the better ones and which are not. Um, Could you yeah. please allow me to actually uh, give you and the Rawa a shout out on this podcast? Please? Because... Uh, well, well, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, you've been on our winning streak in terms of awards. Yeah, no, it's been quite which a Which has been yes. cool. Uh, last time I saw you, we were maybe both getting an award. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, we were, so well done, we were, you. Yeah. well done to you. Well done to you. Well done to you. Yeah, well done yeah. to you. Uh, and and you, your, your group was given an award by the university for your research <laughs> output. But perhaps, and I'm not trying to sort of discredit or put down the University of Aberdeen at all, you were given one that may in some people's opinion, be more prestigious, mm -hmm. which was the Nature Publishing Group. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and your laboratory or... We the, only came the, second, to be fair, I should give it. <laughs> yeah, but this was a, a global was assessment global, yeah. we did of... Second in the world's not bad, yeah. To, yeah. to Jeffrey Gordon and yeah. co, which I think is, is fantastic. So, so I wanted that, to yeah. just no, give you kudos you. for that. But I also wanted to say, sort of on record, because you were one of the first people I spoke to about mm -hmm. my interest in the microbiome seven mm -hmm. or eight years ago, that I, I do genuinely believe that if it wasn't for your your interest and your altruism and trying to help me, likewise with Petra and everyone else who was involved at the time, would never have got going because I didn't know what I was doing. I still <laughs> maybe don't. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I know more now. <laughs> so thank you for that. No, it was an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank amazing. you for that. It's been, it's been awesome. And we've collaborated uh, on various different things for, for the last, well, five, seven years. It's been wonderful to see the company grow, yeah. yeah thank you. So so back to the Rowett then and, and the diet. So... um. I've asked you to describe the sort of analytical toolkit. So how are yeah. you using technologies to help answer your questions? Yeah. So so there, as, as technology has evolved over the last 20 years, that, that, that has also evolved. So um, initially what we used to do would do sort of marker gene sequencing, it's called, and that's just one gene from 
the bacteria, which all bacteria have, and by sequencing that gene, you could work out which bugs were present. So right. that's like I say, these these sort of gold rush days stuff that we did lots of, you know, in disease X, what's in someone's mm. gut versus a healthier control. So um, that that was done for a lot, and it's still done, and it's still a useful thing to do. You know, if you mm. want to just want to know which bugs there. It's a very good way of, uh, of doing that. As the technology's evolved and it's got cheaper and higher throughput, then what people have evolved to do is just basically brute force, just smash up your sample, sequence as much of the DNA as possible, and then what you end up with is essentially like a thousand little jigsaw puzzles. Okay. These are the, the genomes of these bugs, which are the tiny little fragments of their genes which you have to try and put back together. Um, and so imagine a thousand jigsaw puzzles being dumped in a big pile and then someone takes the box away and then you have to wow. try to assemble. That's essentially what has to happen. Hey. And so there's been huge revolutions in the computer algorithms to try and do this sort of you know mathematical problem solving to put these yep. together. And we're at a point now, which I think is super cool, is that you can basically construct a genome from a bug by piecing together all these little bits of the puzzle that you've never grown in the lab before. And essentially you have the complete biology of the organism there in its genome. Wow. So in theory, you should know what that bug can do. In practice, bugs don't always do what their genes say they might. You know, you know just because you've got the gene doesn't mean they're actively doing anything with okay. it. But yeah. in theory, that allows you access to any bug as long as you can sequence it in enough depth. That, like I say, we maybe haven't grown in the lab before yet. I know nothing about. So just on that super point, exciting. That, I mean, that is super exciting. But just on that point, why is it important to have grown something in a lab before? And yeah. Yeah. how much of the microbiome within the human yeah. database has not yet been cultured? Good questions also. I mean, it's, I, I do a lot of culturing work, so I'm going to argue very strongly for culturing, but I can back it up with reasons. <laughs> so um, so if you read the literature, one of the things you'll read quite often is that 99% of bugs can't be grown, and so we need to do sequencing. Um, that might be true in things like soil, when bugs double every three months. You're never going to grow that in a, in a lab. In the gut, we're quite fortunate. You know, the bugs have to grow fast, or you're going to poop them out the other end. Um, and mm -hmm. we kind of know what they're eating, right? They're eating what we're eating. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yep. So actually, a relatively high proportion of the bugs, maybe 60, 70 percent of the bugs in the gut have actually been grown, we think. Maybe more, depending on some of these metagenome genomes turn out to be real and not artifactual, but I won't go into that. Um, so yeah, so, so we actually have a pretty high proportion of the bugs right. from the human gut already in culture. And the reason why that's good, um, well, there are multiple reasons. Um, one is actually, if you have it in the lab, you can do experiments with it. You know, a, a DNA sequence you can't really do much with other than try and work at what it does. Yeah. Um, if you have it in the lab, you can test it. So say, oh, this bug has the genes for starch utilization. You can grow that in the lab and test it. And sometimes what the genes say it might do doesn't always match what it does. So actually verifying things is good. Um, you can use those bugs to make much better reference databases. It's a bit technical, but essentially the better the reference databases, the better the sequencing based projects are. You can map them back um, so you can work at what the bugs are. Having a name for a bug, can actually be super useful. A lot of people don't like names, but you know, if I tell you you've got C. difficile in your gut, I think it's useful to have a name for that bug I rather agree. than sequence number X, Y, five. I totally agree with that. So having it, so having a bug in culture means you can characterize it properly, give it a name. It also allows you to and bestow an honor upon people who true, do yes. good work, right? That's true, yeah, you can. You can give uh, a few people that are out have got bugs named after them now. Not me, sadly, but yeah, you know. <laughs> so what do you have um, to do? Just hang around and be good. <laughs> so, uh, no, honestly, it's probably one of the highest honours you can get as a microbiologist. Oh, for sure. Someone's valued your work enough that they'll name the bug after you. And I'd say at the right, we're really fortunate. We've got uh, Petra, Sylvia and Ari, you've all had bugs named after. Is that right? Which is, yeah, which is really amazing, actually. Yeah. It's a testament to the great work. That's class. Done. Way before I started, they were doing fantastic work. So, That's class. Um, no, they're brilliant. Um, so anyway, yeah. So And the final thing, the good thing about having bugs in culture is, if you have a bug in culture, you can develop it as a therapy. Right. So, you know, if you right. if the bug turns out to be a beneficial type probiotic type bug, you can't give someone the DNA and hope that it's going to do anything. You need the bug. So for all those reasons, uh, and that's why I talked to you before about this shift in the field from yeah. lots of sequencing and now a sort of gradual realization that maybe we do need to go back to the lab a little yeah. bit for those reasons. And um, yeah, there's lots of value still in the old school microbiology. Mm. How is, to use a buzzword, hmm. AI yeah. coming into this field? Yeah. So, you know, it's a really good question. And I have to, it's not my core area, so I'm kind of speculating a little, but ah, fine, I'll, I'll speculate. <laughs> so, you know, given the complexity of the microbiota, right, it, you know, it's too much for the human brain to try and disentangle. So I do think there is potential there if you've got a computational brain doing the work for you. Um, the only note of caution I'll add is that, you know, of course, modeling and this sort of stuff is only as good as the data you mm, feed into it. Right. Garbage in, garbage right. out. 
Right. right. So again, if we're going to talk about myths later, if you type into chat GPT who invented the word microbiome, it will tell you it was Joshua Lederberg, and that's not true, right? But because chat GPT reads this in all the literature, yeah. it parrots back what it's been fed in. So, so AI can take you so far, yeah. but fundamentally you need that high quality underlying data. And as we maybe talk mm. about, it's not always the case with quite a lot of microbiome. Have you tried to data. debate with chat GPT on something? Um, I have, yeah. So have I. <laughs> I, I, I was really impressed. We had a long debate around full spectrum versus defined consortium. Yeah, yeah. I was yep, like, keep yep. going, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> really good. Yeah, no, honestly, I think um, really good. Yeah, no, it's um, it can really hit the spot sometimes. And again, it's I think it's down to the quality of the data that it's given. That makes sense. You know, um, sometimes it's off. Um, for a laugh, I typed in, "Is Jim Goodwin a good manager?" And it said, "Yes, that's wrong." <laughs> right? so, you know, <laughs> that's an esoteric joke for uh, yeah. for Aberdeen fans there. Um, anyway. Um, you know, it's so it's like I say, with these tools that only ever going to be as good as what they've been fed on. And um, and that will obviously get better as knowledge improves mm -hmm. and it adds to it. So I do think it's a really exciting area and mm. I do think it's got huge potential for yeah. particularly for really complex problems like the microbiome where it's just so difficult yep. for a human brain to disentangle. <clears throat> now you've spoken about marker gene surveys, so 16S mm -hmm. sequencing, mm -hmm. and that brings me to something I wanted to discuss with you, which mm -hmm. was at home microbiome testing. Yes. So it's kind of fascinating, right? So you, mm -hmm. you're someone who's been in this field for 20 years. You're part mm -hmm. of a research group that's been given the highest accolades. And you said earlier on that you can't tell what a healthy microbiome is by looking yeah. at it, right? Yeah. So there's lots of companies offering this. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to name names. Mm -hmm. um, that's good. But we, both, we, we, we both know people who are yeah. involved in this. Yeah. How much value do you think these at-home tests have? So I think the answer I usually give, because I get asked this quite a bit, is that you know sometimes it's just nice to know. You know, so I've been involved in studies. I've got my microbiome profile. It's quite interesting to see what's in there, right? Mm -hmm. oh, I've got these bugs. I've got these bugs. Mm -hmm. I think, as, as I alluded to before, the problem is we actually don't know what the vast majority of these bugs actually do. And a lot of it's probably context dependent anyway. You know, a bug that might help you protect you against pathogens mm -hmm. uh, might also be pumping out a chemical that might increase your risk of bowel cancer 30 years down the line, right? So is that a good or a bad bug, right? You know, and so I think the problem is that even some of the E. coli that people have studied for like decades and decades, we still don't know what half the genes do. These bugs, which, you know, really are massively under-researched and even now with the big active in the field, we really don't know what the vast majority of these bugs will do. And that's what really fascinates me as a scientist. That's the stuff I'm interested in. So when you get a profile from these companies, I guess, you know, you know, if I had low diversity, lots of proteobacteria, but I'd be like, mm, that's not great. What would you do? Yeah, but, but so well, I'd probably start eating more fiber, but I guess we come on to that. Yes. Um, but yeah, but I mean, does that tell me fundamentally that I am definitely screwed with something it doesn't no, right you know no. and i think that is the issue i think a lot of people who do these tests they're kind of worried and they've got concerns and they do it and they hope that the answer will be in their microbiome i know the answer might be in the microbiome but unfortunately where we are right now it's very difficult to to take a profile and go right you've definitely got this problem x y yeah. and z i mean but, even somebody if you've got you've got c to the seal in your gut yeah sure. you know three percent five percent carry that without any harm done until sure. they're old and they take antibiotics. So, babies have loads, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. And yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah, and they're fine. Yeah. So again, just because something is on a profile doesn't necessarily mean that you've got something bad. So that's where we are with the microbiome field. I think, I think the answer to a lot of questions you might ask is that we're kind of in a vacuum situation now where people know the microbiome is important. It is, we've discussed this. Yes. But we haven't quite worked out yet how to harness it. And so that vacuum is kind of filled with sort of traditional probiotics, these sort of services where... They're interesting, but actually the scientific proof at this point, possibly not there in a lot of cases. Mm. On your statement around most people believe the microbiome is important, I would mm -hmm. concur. It's mm -hmm. changed a lot yep. in the last seven years. Yeah, yep. people definitely there are, are more aware of it. Yeah. Still people, <clears throat> in, in my line of work, I'm involved in trying to convince <laughs> people that this is important and it's worthwhile investing in, you yep. know, either as a partnership mm -hmm. or through a, an equity investment yep. or whatever. Yeah. I do still come across people mm. who say, it's not important, highly skeptical. So, I mean, I'd like to think the field has moved away from that point where people are skeptical about its importance. I think you can have skepticism for individual conditions, right? So like, you know, my, my one is obesity, right? I don't think the microbiota is a major player in obesity, right? If you want to lose weight, you know, the traditional ways of doing that are going to work way better than taking a probiotic, right? And I'm happy to discuss that. Yeah, because this but, is a so, debate so, 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 people. So, you know, I, I have skepticism for individual conditions, right? Yes. The people who write off microbiome for everything are being contrarianism for the sake of it. It's, 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 there's, there's lots of promise in the microbiome. Mm. Whether we're there yet in most conditions, I would argue probably not. Mm. But the promise absolutely remains. 
Can we talk about obesity? Go on then. So, so I, I, do, I had a debate with uh, Prof. Karen Scott on this, mm -hmm. and I also had um, Richard Hansen and Costas mm -hmm. from yeah, Glasgow sure. and Dundee. Yeah. Well, Hansen's now at Dundee. Yes. Costas is yep. in Glasgow. All great people. Yeah. All great people. Yeah. And I, I'm just really here to be devil's advocate. You know, I, I, I believe fundamentally that the best way to you mm -hmm. know improve your body composition is a regular exercise regime, mm -hmm. looking at your macronutrient intake. Mm -hmm. Changing your calorie intake mm -hmm. if it's too high. Yep. I don't believe a calorie is a calorie. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it is insofar as it yep. is a unit of measurement. Sure. Yeah. However, if you're giving 100 calories in a bar full of fiber mm -hmm. versus 100 calories in yeah. uh, dextrose tablets, yeah. your utilization of those calories yeah, is going to be very to different to the body. You will utilize them differently. Yeah. And by the way, fiber is huge. Yeah. Fiber is yeah. fundamental. Yeah. Which is why you can eat loads of fruit. Yeah and not see dramatic shifts in your yeah. blood glucose, and yeah. fructose is okay in fruit because of the fiber. I mean, that most people. <laughs> most people. So there's a brilliant study that came out, um, I think it's 2019, Zevia talents in Cell, um, where they, they, they talked about personalized nutrition, and, yes. they, they, and they did the glucose so Israeli monitors. Group? Yeah, yeah. yeah, they did the glucose monitors on the arm. If you can get one of them on, you should talk to them. They're interesting. <laughs> Um, and, and it's a really can you interesting like, can you study. Like me? So, Do you know them? So uh, yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so um, cool. But yeah, no, it's super interesting. So they, they they took a bunch of volunteers and they put them with these continuous glucose monitors so they could track blood glucose all the time, and they um and they and they fed them set diets yeah. and so then they monitored how their glucose spiked, and so for most people. You give them like a biscuit, a cookie, you get the spike in blood glucose, as you'd expect, right? Um, you give them a banana, pretty flat, as you were just saying, fruit, yeah. fine. For a small number of people, um, the opposite pattern happens. So you give them a biscuit, a cookie, no blood glucose spike, give them a banana, boom. Right, so at a population level, the advice, eat bananas, not cookies, is excellent advice, right? But at the level of that individual, that's terrible advice. You're basically getting them to eat something that's continually spiking their blood glucose levels. So, and I think, you know... Is that microbiome at play? So they argue a little bit. I, I argue possibly, I don't get that, to be honest, because most of the sugar is absorbed in the small intestine before it even gets to your colonic microbiota. So mm. what's in your stool will not at all reflect what is utilizing sugar further up in your in your gut. So I, I have some dubious thoughts about that. But um, but anyway, so, so but you're right about calories, not also calorie, but I do think how the body responds is probably a bit more individualistic than mm. has, considered, has been considered in the field before, and it is an area that people are going into. And the microbiome could be a determinant. So, so the, the, the microbiome and obesity, I mean, if I'm going to touch on that, I'm not saying microbiome has no effect on weight, right? It's clear if you have a microbiome that's better able to extract energy from your diet, you will get more. And the reason that happens is it breaks down the fiber into short chain fatty acids. You absorb them, you get energy from those acids. Now, some people's microbiota will be better than others at breaking down and releasing sugars. So, yes. uh, acids, sorry. So there's definitely going to be some amount of variation in the amount of calories you extract from fiber, for example. Yep. Um, but you're talking tens of calories, not hundreds of calories, mm -hmm. right? And so over the course of your life, people say, yeah, but that tens of calories every day adds up and adds up and adds up and adds up. Your body will equilibrate, right? A larger body needs more calories to maintain it. So I can get how your microbiome might move you to a little bit and then you equilibrate. It's not going to continue and make you more weight, mm -hmm. more weight, more weight, more weight. So no, I don't believe that the microbiota is leading to an obesity epidemic. It hasn't changed that much in 30, 40 years, whereas the levels of obesity has really rocked. Is that true though? Because yeah. the food industry, in some respects, has moved to a much more calorie dense, micronutrient mm -hmm. light, fiber yeah. light composition. Mm -hmm. Definitely and, so. And, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm not, uh, where I sit on this actually is more, mm -hmm. our diet's changed, mm -hmm. so our microbiota's changed. Yeah. And the microbiota through mechanisms, and I'm getting a bit into woo-woo land here, but just, <laughs> just let, let me feel free and indulge. I think there's so much I don't understand about the communication between the microbiome and the wider body, mm -hmm. including the brain. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And my view is that, so it's a self-perpetuating cycle mm -hmm. of, I'll call it badness. It's okay. not a scientific term, but it's badness. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so the, the cycle is, in someone that's predisposed, has a predisposition through genetics. Mm -hmm. And I believe that obesity is largely yeah. genetic. It's human. Well, no, I agree with that. I, yeah. I got my DNA sequence, just to button briefly, I got my DNA sequence when I was at the Sanger Institute as a sort of pre-test. And I got it back and it was like, you're bald, you're very pale, and you're probably overweight. 
Is that what it said? Yeah, I didn't tell it that, right? You know, so that is, is that what it said? Yeah, that's what it said, yeah. So, um, so you know, there is something in that people will eat more depending on their genetics. That's now, fascinating. Yeah. So when, when we were asked about um, what does Alan look like, I would have said, just look at his genome sequence. And that'll, tell, <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that'll tell you exactly what you need to know. Nailed me right down to it, like red that's hair. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, I, I told them nothing about me, obviously. That's fascinating. So, so part of it is in your genes. Definitely. Um, you know, um, but can I just go back to the yeah, badness? Yeah, please, so, so, finish so, your point, the, sorry. The sorry, badness sorry. and the self perpetuating yes, cycle. Yes, so sorry. someone has a predisposition. Now, if that person was in a jungle mm -hmm. and all they had to eat mm -hmm. was fiber and vegetables mm -hmm. and lean proteins, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure yeah. that they would be as obese as they no, were I, You're 100% right. Environment plus genetics Environment. interacts. Yeah. And the last element is, so yes, it's the calorie-dense foods, mm -hmm. but this self-perpetuating cycle, just to wrap this up, is... Mm -hmm. The microbiota changes in response to the input, mm -hmm. which is these sort of sugary, maximally processed fiber or light mm -hmm. foods. Yeah. Therefore, you may get these blooms in, mm -hmm. for example, the proteobacteria, mm -hmm. enterobacteria, AC, that kind of thing. Yeah. And through mechanisms that I hope you or someone, <laughs> you know, in the realm of research determines, they mm -hmm. communicate with the brain mm -hmm. and they say, we need some more of that. Okay. We need some more of that sugary stuff. <laughs> I think his brain already asks enough for that sugary stuff. I think they need your microbes it, on top. But is, is it, <laughs> it tastes the, good? It, it, it tastes <laughs> good, but, but maybe there's something more there. Is there? Could there be something more there? So, we, so, so the small intestine goes, yeah. oh, we just love this sugar mm -hmm. bath. Mm -hmm. We need more. Mm -hmm. So we're going to produce these molecules. So, I mean, yeah, besides, like, I will say I'm not a... Uh, a scientist that works on the biology of obesity and the, but I, I work in an institute that is obviously so you pick up some knowledge by osmosis you know the body is a brilliant fantastic feedback loop system it detects when it's eating food it releases all sorts of hormones that determine whether you want to eat again mm. or not right um, there's certainly some evidence that some of the things the microbiota can make might cross react with hormones for example like GABA yeah um, serotonin so I, I get all these things right but again, um, you know, whenever you try and do things like fecal transplants in obese people, they do not lose weight. You know, they oh, do things like insulin yeah, things yeah, maybe happen. Yeah. They, they know what, this has been done multiple times. Yeah. No one's losing weight on a fecal transplant. I have also looked at this evidence extensively. And yeah. my, my issue with it, well, I have a few issues with it. One issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have many, many issues with fecal transplant studies in terms of is what you're giving to each of the patients the same mm -hmm. you know, as a study properly sure. designed, yeah. so on, so on. Yeah. Yeah. It's very hard to make the case for mm. FMT in this particular indication that FMT alone, mm. without controlling all the other factors like diet, for example, yeah. is going to have an impact. But Matt, it's a minuscule. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you're right. So this whole start, this whole thing started with the mm. case report. Mm -hmm. I think it was seven years ago now. Yep. You know the story? Yeah, I know the story. Yeah, but please, probably your listeners don't. So, yeah. Well, I'm sure we've talked about it before, but there was a case report, a high, high impact journal case yeah. report. Yeah. Essentially, a woman received a microbiome transplant, we call it a fecal microbiota transplantation yeah. or an intestinal microbiota transfer to use updated mm -hmm. nomenclature from a relative who was overweight. Mm -hmm. And this case report described mm -hmm. rapid onset weight gain. Yeah. yeah, sure. So everyone then said, yeah. okay, microbiomes caused this, but then there's been randomized control trials since there's been retrospective analysis of stool bank studies and there hasn't been any impact. So, so again, I cannot get across to people who may not be scientists, general public, that case reports are the lowest form of evidence, right? It's, it's I mean, it, it goes back to, you know, I can take a crystal from a crystal shop, rub it on my rash and my skin, my rash went away, the crystal did it, right? <laughs> Right, there's no evidence might, for that. It might have done no, it. No, it might have done it, <laughs> but then, you know, um, but it didn't, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah, so that yeah. person may have gained weight anyway. Yep. There's no proof that that came directly from the, the, the transplant that With they you. got. So, so With you. case reports are interesting and they might send you down a path of inquiry, yep. but on their I'm own, they are worthless almost. You worthless. Know? So, um, so, you know, I, like, I mean, again, I think we talk about this, maybe just briefly detour into the scientific method. The scientific yeah, method please. is beautiful, right? It's, it's like, science gets a lot of bad press, you know, and, you know, scientists are terrible people, blah, blah, blah. Scientists are human beings, they make mistakes, right? Yeah. Um, but that's a very, very small proportion, a very small proportion are fraudulent, right? But the scientific method is brilliant because mistakes get corrected, yeah. right? And, you know, so a case report is a case report. Does it repeat? Do other people independently find the same thing? If the answer is no, then that's a weird oddity that who knows what happened, right? You know, uh, it's the crystal on the, on the rash, right? Yeah. It's nothing. And so the scientific process is a beautiful thing. The problem is it's really slow. 
right? It takes years and years, decades and decades. Can I ask you a question? Are you, are you into crystals? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a random thing. I, I see crystal shops in my local high street and they really annoy me. But anyway, that's my I, did, I didn't have you down as a crystal guy. But I just I'm quite to... the opposite. Yeah. Uh, I, I just don't like, uh, I don't like woo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm a scientist by nature. You know, anything you claim should be evidence-based. And you know, Got it. Um, yeah. And so if that I case see. report lacks the level of evidence required to really claim that, yeah. That's what I, 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 yeah, so I agree, and, I, and I'm I'm just stirring the pot a little bit. To see Stir away. Can, you know, <laughs> 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 now we've talked about diet and the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions we get quite a lot from the listeners is, what what mm -hmm. can I do to yeah. improve my microbiome? Yeah, I get that a lot too. Yep, yep, yep. So. So I mean, like I said, I'm a microbiologist for 20 odd years now, and the only thing I've ever done to improve my microbiome is eat more fiber. I don't take probiotics. I don't do anything else because essentially I don't need to. I'm, apart from being a bit chubby, mm -hmm. nothing wrong with me, right? <laughs> um, uh, it's not going to make my hair grow back. Um, so no, um, but I do eat more fiber because um, there's letters of evidence now that you know, for most people, and I, I really, it's a nuance again in microbiome. Yep. Definitive statements are never true for most people. More fiber is the best advice you give them at this point in time. And that has the nice benefit that it basically agrees with nutritional advice going back decades, right? That fiber is generally a good thing for right. all sorts of other reasons, right? Cholesterol lowering, you know, improves transit rate, whatever. There's a million reasons why fiber is good. And so what the microbiome work does is just add another layer to that recommendation. Yeah. It doesn't tell you anything different. Um, now, there are some mechanism. people, well, and, and, well, some of the mechanism, you know, it's cool, not going right? to be all the mechanism, but it'll be some of it. Now, for some people, unfortunately, they just cannot tolerate fiber. And so for those people, it's actually bad advice, you know, you can give them IBS, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, again, it has to be nuanced. For me, I don't get IBS. I'm quite happy eating fiber. And so the one thing I've done since becoming a microbiologist is I do eat more fiber regularly. Um, I was a very Scottish male. <laughs> Lived off. Uh, what does that mean? Bacon uh, rolls and uh, no, yeah. chips? Uh, butteries, rowies if you're from Aberdeen. Yeah. <laughs> no one else knows what that is. Um, a lot a delicacy. Of just, yeah, yeah, just simple dishes, no pasta, no vegetables, no fruit, you know, just yeah. beer. Scottish man. <laughs> <laughs> Since working on Typical microbiota. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do eat a lot more fibre than I used to, yeah. So, like, can we unpack that a little bit? So when mm -hmm. we talk about fibre, can we yeah. break it down, you know, soluble, insoluble? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you're, you're right, there's lots of different types of fibres. Different plants will have different types in them. You know, some fibres will feed particular bugs, other fibres will feed other bugs. Yep. Um, and so the general advice usually is a nice mix of fibres to try and give everyone a bit of something that they like, you know, in their gut. Um, the interesting thing for me from fibre is, you know, you can take an identical fibre, you and I can eat exactly the same fibre, but have a very different gut response. And the reason for that is that you have a different starting microbiota than I do. And so say again, we go back to that example of starch. If you've got ruminococcus bromide in your gut, it will go up. We've shown that repeatedly now. If I don't have ruminococcus bromide, and not everyone does, something else will go up instead. Um, and so say I've got eubacterium rectale, that might go up. Now, erectile makes butyrate, Ruminococcus bromii makes ethanol. So, you know, is it a good thing for you to take resistant starch if it makes an ethanol producer go through the roof? Mm. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know what Ruminococcus bromii does for health. For me, in theory, a butyrate producer, that should be good Seems to take good resistant right. starch. But maybe your rectale makes other things that are nasty and increases your risk of bowel cancer 30 years down the line. Mm. And that's what I'm getting at when I say we really lack, at this point in time, the ability to say with confidence that if you do intervention X, Y, Z, mm this is what's going to happen to you because a lot of it is quite individual. What I found really interesting observing science and observing people who are interested in gut health, so mm. the, it used to be this sort of natural path, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, functional medicine doctors. Yep. 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 If you go back in time, they would say things like minimally processed foods, yep. eat lots of fiber, yep. <clears throat> don't consume lots of sugar because it damages the gut mm -hmm. barrier integrity. Mm -hmm. And that was woo for a while, mm. but now it's not woo and it's in vogue. And, yeah. it, and it aligns to it aligns to what you're seeing, though. So again, I will. I, will, I think some of the reasons behind it are woo. <laughs> so I think the general advice is fine, but you get like, for example, you can Google up things online. You know, eat yeah. cucumbers; it scrapes the bad bacteria as no. bacteria, put it off the that. Does, does it do that? No, it doesn't, right? But that's woo. Um, but you know, eating cucumbers, fiber is probably not a bad thing, right? So I think I, I would warn people that a lot of these general good pieces of advice, although they are good piece of advice, the evidence they use to back that up is. Okay. Guff. It's nonsense. Yeah. How do people know if it's guff or not? So this for me is the biggest issue in the microbiome field, right? You can Google up microbiome right now and you will be inundated with a million different things telling you a million different things that they'll tell you have brilliant evidence for. And I guarantee you, with almost without fail, most of them will have no quality evidence for the claims they're making. And so as a consumer, what do you do? 
You know, it's... Um, what do you do? Well, I don't have any of them. That's what I'm saying. As a consumer, I eat more fiber. I don't take anything else, right? Mm. But again, I'm ostensibly well, uh, healthy. I don't need to, mm. in my mind, take anything else. People get desperate. They've got conditions. Their normal doctor is not able to help them. So mm. they go to the internet. I, I absolutely empathize, right? You'll try anything. Mm. Um, you know, people take advantage of that, you know? There are people making a lot of good money off the microbiome without much evidence to support it, unfortunately. How do people know what kind of fiber... Mm. they should be eating or yeah. how do you know if you know an apple contains pectin yeah right? chicory contains inulin yeah yeah but what does that mean so again like i said it depends on me or you who's eating it right if you've got a decent pectin degrader like faecal bacterium brasnitia makes lots of nice butyrate then for you eating apples might be great mm. if i've got a bacteroides uniformis that eats lots of pectin and makes a nasty sort of compound maybe it's not great right so again the problem is i cannot reproducibly tell you you have to have fiber x to be healthy i don't think i'm there yet now some people are trying to do that and i think this is an yeah. area that is actually coming. coming rapidly it's coming but right now it's very difficult um so again if you eat an apple and you don't get sick, you don't get bloating, you feel fine, keep eating apples, you know? <laughs> that is my general advice. If you're happy with it, you feel good with it, fine. So people should try lots of different things, figure out what works for them. For me, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing about fibre is, unless you're one of these people that can't tolerate it, it's unlikely to do you any harm, right? So, right. Yeah. So even if you're yeah not getting any benefit mm -hmm. from it, it's not going to do you much harm. Tell me about probiotics. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rant, sorry. Yeah. So I think... Um, <laughs> Probiotics as a concept is a great concept, right? Taking a beneficial bug, improving health, there's lots of nice promise in that. The word probiotic itself, I hate the word probiotic, right? And I'll tell you why I hate the word probiotic. It's a meaningless word, right? Because what is a probiotic? If you think of probiotic, what, what is a probiotic? You tell me, give me, name me a probiotic. I would refer to the WHO definition. And no, I'm... no, I'm talking about a bug. Name me a bug that's a probiotic. Fecalibacterium prosecutiae. Okay, you can't actually buy those. I'm probably not. But anyway, name me another bug. Was that, was a, that a probiotic bug? Um, no, we can't buy them in the shelf as yet, as far as I'm aware of. Name me another probiotic. That'll bug. be my next venture. Yeah, yeah. coming, coming yeah. soon. Well, we coming can talk soon. about that in a minute. Coming, no, coming soon. Well, you got the supermarket. What do you buy in the shelf? Um, okay, so supermarket ones, we would have Lactobacillus. Mm -hmm. We would have Bifidobacterium. Okay, so I'll stop you there, right? So you've named me two bugs from two completely different phyla of bacteria. They have not been related for billions of years and yet you've called them the same thing, a probiotic, right? Mm -hmm. They are totally different things, right? So to me, as you, you've got a clinical background, right? It's a bit like saying, uh, you've got a headache, a uh, mild headache, I'll give you heroin. It's a painkiller, just like aspirin, right? They're I mean, both painkillers. They probably do the job. They would do the job, right? <laughs> but you know, you might have some downstream problems, yeah? So you know, heroin and aspirin are both painkillers, <laughs> yeah. but they have very different like, mechanisms of actions and problems, etc. So you would never do that with any other type of intervention. You know, it's like, oh, you're ill, I'll just give you a drug. Which one, mm. right? So probiotic is a meaningless word because mm. there are so many different bugs with so many different activities. What do you mean by probiotic, right? And so the world is highly unhelpful. Um, you know, and again, even if you get down to the species level, you've got a lactobacillus, whatever, in this pot, and you've got the same lactobacillus in this pot, but it's a different strain, right? You know, I made a PhD student called Matthew Dalby used to use this analogy, so I'm gonna steal it from him. You know, you know uh, Rottweilers and Chihuahuas are both dogs, same species but you're only using one as a guard dog, right? It's a chihuahua, they're vicious, right? They're <laughs> <laughs> I know, but they're both dogs, right? You. Same species. I These two you. lactobacillus in the yep. pot are both the same species, but they're different strains. So, you know, different strains can yep. have very different activities. So for me... Can we exemplify that? With it's... Um, e coli? E e e yeah, well, you know, e coli, e coli 0157 will rot your kidneys and potentially kill you. E coli nisli is a pro probiotic, right? You know, there it's you the go. same species, right? So, so for me, it's just well, not a helpful term. You know, it's um, if you need the precision of something to work, you need the precision of the product and the word probiotic. So, you know, you, you do meta-analyses. So we looked at the effect of probiotics on mental health, whatever. And you look at it, there's like 10, 20, 30 different products, different doses, different lengths of time, different species. Oh, we didn't find a consistent picture. Well, of course you didn't. <laughs> You're looking at completely different products. And so the word probiotic is just useless. You know, we need the precision of, you know, if I'm ill with inflammatory bowel disease, I want to take F. Yeah. not a yeah. probiotic. You yeah. want to take the bug, you know? So, and that for me really frustrates me. You can see I'm getting quite animated this is about good. it because yeah. it's, um, it just, does, it really doesn't help the field progress either because people as consumers take a probiotic, it doesn't work for them. No, it's all rubbish, right? Right. And it isn't all rubbish, right? Some right. of it's rubbish. We've talked about this, but not all of it is. There's some good stuff in there as well. So, so where do we go next? Oh, honestly, this is the toughest question you can ask me the whole day. It's really tough. You know, I mean, um, 
the bar has been set quite high by the European regulatory authorities. You have to have a really proper health game. And actually, I'm okay with that because I am a consumer fundamentally. I want proof that my product will work. Mm. But that does stifle innovation because if you've got a product that billions of people buy already, then why would you do the test? I might tell you it doesn't work. <laughs> right? So you've undermined your own product. People are buying it anyway. So it's really tough, you know. Um, so where I stand on probiotics is they have huge potential. The word itself doesn't help. I think we need much more precision, one type of bug for one type of condition. Right and really get the evidence that that particular bug will do something. So that sounds a bit like a drug. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah, for me, you know, I, 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 people talk about it being a food. I think they sit in that middle ground, right? And it depends what you want to use it for, right? If you want to take one and feel good about yourself, then fine, you don't need the level of, you know, let the placebo effect kick in, be happy, mm. right? But if you want a particular bug for a particular condition, then that's a drug, right? Mm. You know, you're trying to cure something. So can you, with all the experience that you have, talk about how I'll use probiotics. I know we don't like the word, but I'll use the word probiotics. Fine. No, it's fine. Everyone does fine. <laughs> so so the, the currently available probiotics that are off the shelf, mm -hmm. how they were designed and developed yeah. versus yeah. where we need to go. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, I will say there is decent evidence for a few of these products for specific conditions that actually they, they have decent efficacy. So, you know, um, premature babies are a prime, a prime example. Babies are born very premature. They're very susceptible to an inflammatory condition called necrotizing enterocolitis. There's now pretty good evidence that any of these lactobacilli bifidobacteria, you can really drop the rate of that really terrible disease by about yeah. half, right? So, so some conditions, these, these existing probiotics, actually the, the evidence is good. For most things that are claimed for them, the evidence isn't there yet, I would say. It doesn't mean they don't do it. But at this point in time, the evidence is usually not there for most other things. Um, now, I would argue that these are the wrong type of bugs. Um, lactobacilli are relatively dominant in the small intestine. So if you've got a small intestinal problem, maybe they're the right bug. Mm -hmm. And the large intestine, they're not 0.01%, maybe on average. They're, they're a minority wow. component, right? So if you want to solve something in your colon, it's the wrong bug, right? And so we would argue instead that some of the other bugs, the, like your faecalibacteriums you talked about, your, I don't know, your... Roseburias, you know, e-bacteria, you know, all these bugs, which most people have never heard of, they're the ones that are 5, 10, 15, 20% your microbiota. So if they're healthy, I would argue they're likely to have more of an impact than these invading type lactobacilli that don't live there anyway. So that's the principle. These are where we might want to go in the future and lots mm -hmm. of people are looking. Um, again, there's also a caveat with microbiome. One is we still don't really know yet mm -hmm. what effects a lot of these bugs will have. Some of them might have off-target effects, might be very individual specific. Um, and also, they're really hard to work with. So <laughs> they're, uh, they're obligate anaerobes, so they die when you expose them to air. So some of the bugs that I've just talked about, Faecalibacterium, a few seconds exposure to air, it's dead. Wow. So you're not going to put that in a yogurt pot and put it on no. a supermarket shelf. It's just not going to survive. So, so there are challenges to getting some of these bugs into people. Now, luckily, there's lots of people in various parts of the world, well, maybe not lots, but a few people trying to get through that technical challenge. And I don't think it's insurmountable. I think it's definitely plausible that you get some sort of encapsulation that keeps the bugs safe enough that you definitely. can swallow them and then get them into your body. So definitely. so I think that's a nice thing about being such a dynamic sort of um, mm -hmm. active field is there's lots of progress being made all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I do hold out some hope that these bugs will eventually be useful um, as sort of next generation probiotics, if mm -hmm. that's the, way, the word you want to use. But, but I do think as a field, a specific bug for a specific treatment is probably the way to go. So there's, there's, there's microbes everywhere. Mm -hmm. Why do we not see microbes that you see in a dog in a human? Yeah, it's a good question. So partly it's diet. So a dog obviously is not eating much fiber. So, you know, the fiber degraders aren't going to set up home in there. Um, partly it's host selection. You know, the, the anatomy of a dog intestine is different from our intestines. So the bugs that okay. like our intestines don't necessarily like what's in a, a dog's gut. Um, some of it's host genetics. They will right. select different bugs. So again, and again, what they're exposed to, you know, dogs eat poo. Most people don't eat poo, right? So you're not going to be inoculating yourself in that same way. Right. So you know, all of these reasons combine to, to, to make us sort of more unique as a species mm. with what we've got in our gut. How many different types of species are there in the human gut? Like, oh God, yeah, that's, that's quite an open question. So it depends on the method used, you know. So if you culture the bugs, you might get a few hundred. These metagenome, assembled genomes I talked about, they're getting into tens of thousands now. So, you know, now whether they're true or artifactual is, yeah, you know, these jigsaw puzzles mm -hmm. might just be a couple of jigsaws stuck together from different bugs and it looks like a new one, but actually you've created this weird it's mosaic. So some of them may not end up being real. And, um, but yeah, so so I guess the, the open question is probably at least a few thousand, I guess, based yeah. on the evidence. Mm -hmm. And in each person, there'll be a sub-selection of those. And, you know, there's ones that pass through. You know, there's microbes in your food, you detect them in stool, but they're not living there. They're just 
passing through, you know, things that you swallow in your mouth, mm. you know, all these things. So, um, so you know, what what is a true gut colonizer is not always what's in your stool sample. Some things are just passing through. Mm. And what about genetics and mm -hmm. genomic diversity? So within yeah. the human genome, it's quite constant, isn't it? This yeah, yeah we're, we're all twenty k. Yeah, we're, we're all very very similar to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah cosmetic differences only. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the microbiome came up to fifty percent different. You know, so it's it's a much more diverse um, sort of, um, I guess, phenotype that you get as a human being in your gut microbiome compared to your genome. So it's one of the reasons why the microbiome is considered quite a druggable target. You know, there's not much yeah. you can do. I mean, I thought things are changing with genomes, with CRISPR-Cas type technologies and things, but mm -hmm. um, in theory, it's easier to, to tweak a microbiome than it is to tweak a genome. So mm -hmm. yeah, and one of the reasons why there's such an interest in using it therapeutically. We've talked so much about bacteria today, mm -hmm. but it's not only bacteria, is it? Yep. No, it's true. Yep. Um, you have a small number of fungi in there relative to the uh, the microbes, uh, the bacteria, sorry, and they, they have some impact on um, uh, the host via their immune system and things as well. Um, you have a load of viruses in there, um, an absolute pile of them. Um, I will say that most of them are not the kind that we have to worry about. They're the kind that the bacteria have to worry about. So most of them are in there infecting um, bacteria. So... Um, you know, it's it's one of the amazing things of microbiology is you get these tiny little things and you've got even smaller things that prey on them. Um, so most of the microbes in the gut um, are are basically, you know, the viruses, sorry, are, are attacking the bacteria, not us. Now that might have implications for our health because mm. if it's a beneficial bacterium and it's been wiped out by a virus, then that potentially has impacts for us as hosts mm. as well. But I have to say that's much, much, much less studied than uh, the bacterial component. And, uh, um, you know, viruses are tiny, much more mm. difficult to work with. So, yeah. And the listeners should look up these phage bacteria because I just think it's so cool. It's like little... The, the biology of that is mind-blowing. Yeah. Like, yeah, they dock. Yeah. They dock and then they... they sphere. Shoot. Yeah. It's so no, cool. They, they are, they are um, they're like someone out of a horror movie. Yeah. You know, they just come in with their little tentacles, grab on the poor little bacterium and then inject their DNA through it and then basically just make that bacterium make lots and lots of copies of the virus until it gets full and then it explodes and the <laughs> virus comes out. It's like a, it's someone from Alien, right? Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Truly, uh, you it's know, incredible. nature is both horribly cruel and, and also <laughs> horribly amazing. Yeah, no, it's it's happening inside of us right now. Yeah, no, yeah you've, got, you've, got, you've got basically inside your gut right now, your microbes are breaking down what you have for your breakfast. They're all fighting with each other for it. Some of them are getting on together as friends. It is like a city, you know, That's the same amazing. as humans interacting right now. It's amazing. It's amazing, yeah. So where do you see the field going then? Yes, I mean, where the field is going, I think it's already on this path. It's moving away from the sort of correlative stuff towards more mechanistic stuff. Um, and I genuinely, I do see it coming towards products that actually do bring benefit to health. So, you know, I mean, I think we talk about C to the C a little bit earlier in, in the day, you know, I guess I'm 44 now. Um, so, you know, I, by the age I'd have to worry about C to the C usually is a little bit older in life. When you're a bit more elderly, you're in a hospital bed on antibiotics. I'm pretty sure I can rule out C to the C is going to kill me, right? Because I think by the time I'm old enough to have to worry about it, we will have proper yeah. treatments that will do the job. So I think that's one example where, you know, I absolutely believe we will have microbiome therapeutics that work religiously and are used in clinical practice. I think the, the promise is too high for that to be ignored. There's too mm. much invested in it now. It's coming. Yep. Um, how far that goes, that, 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 I, 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 I guess C. diff is a low-hanging fruit. You've got one pathogen there, you kick it out, the problem's solved. Some of the other conditions where microbiome has been linked to are much, much more complicated. Yep. There's underlying host biology in there to be dealt with too. There's damage to the body already. Mm. And so how far you can take that microbiome, who knows? But it's super exciting to be in the field trying, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so no, I think honestly, um, next couple of decades, I don't say next five years, I think I mean, I'm talking decades. I know some things go fast, but usually I'm a bit scientists, more optimistic. you are more optimistic than me. You know, I, 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 I just published a paper from 13 years ago. Right? <laughs> what? <laughs> yes. So I did the work 13 years ago. So that went wow. past like that. So when people say, where do you see the world in a decade? You know, if you yeah. asked me 13 years ago, I wouldn't have yeah. expected I'd still be writing that paper. Yeah. So, you know, the world goes, the world goes faster than you'd like, yeah. unfortunately. I, I am, I describe it as pathologically optimistic about everything. You certainly are. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Yeah. About everything. <laughs> yes. Timelines, yeah. technical feasibility, yeah. Yeah. what a small group of team yeah. pip members can do within a time frame, you know, yeah. But that's uh, given the motivation, the funding, the impetus, you yeah. can, people can do amazing things. The issue with the microbiome is people are having to do amazing things against a very complicated backdrop that we've talked about, you know. So it's 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 like scaling Everest and then scaling another hundred afterwards. It's uh, a tough challenge. I'm with you. Yeah. So can we talk briefly, sorry, about FMT? I know we mm -hmm. said we're going to move on, sure. but, but but you're here now and why not? Yeah. So open question then. Mm -hmm. 
What are your thoughts on FMT? Yeah, so again, it's nuance always. Every, every time I answer a question, sorry, you never get a, you never get a straight one from mm -hmm. me. Um, for me with FMT, it's very much a risk reward um, intervention. So if you consider C. difficile, where you've got a very elderly patient usually, who is probably going to die mm -hmm. without the FMT, then uh, the risk is very low, right? That poor person was, was going to be very ill anyway. They're very old. There's very little chance for anything to happen mm -hmm. bad after that, right? Mm -hmm. The reward is you cure the disease and the person gets better. They leave hospital the next day, right? So the risk reward is very much in favor of fecal microbiota transplants in that specific case. Absolutely. If you take something else, you know, again, I'm not going to give examples here because I don't want to encourage these sort of things, but you know, there, are, there are people giving fecal transplants to children, for example, for conditions where the reward is not clear because it's not actually been proven mm -hmm. that that microbiota transplant will do anything beneficial for that kid. And the risk is that, um, you know, 30 years time, you give them sure. bowel cancer. Sure. So for me, the risk reward doesn't stack up there. Mm -hmm. So the nuance answer to me is, what does the evidence tell you, right? If the evidence supports its use and it's relatively safe and the risk reward balance is right, then why would you not do it? <laughs> if the evidence isn't there, I would say not yet. No, you need more proof. I'll give you a thought experiment. If I could, if I could produce a capsule for you mm -hmm. that, that had a, ex, you had an extremely high degree of confidence that there were no mm -hmm. pathogens in mm -hmm. there, yeah, and it had high diversity, yeah, and it had twenty different or mm -hmm. fifty different functional mm -hmm. groups, yeah, associated or, or genuses that you would commonly associate with yep. healthy people, yeah. Is there ever a scenario where we would give that to people just routinely to sort of? It's a it's a really good experiment, because, yeah. because yeah. I, and I'll I'll bias you a little bit perhaps yeah. I, mean, I can't bias you but I'll tell you my thoughts just go for it yeah I I do believe that that will be a thing I you know and I want to try and make that happen I to don't be think it's you. beyond the realms of possibility um, I think as we've discussed uh, you can take that pill and you might have a diet that supports them and they'll stay in your gut right I might take that pill and I go back to eating chips and they'll <laughs> they'll die off anyway right so it was pointless for me so again giving that same pill isn't going to have the same response for everyone with you um, what the you. person does is going to have a major impact on how that pill does yeah um, the next thing I say, it's a bit like, I know this is probably going to be completely obscure for anyone who's not listening to the UK. It's a bit deal or no deal. You've got your box, you choose to open it or not, right? Mm. I've got my box of bugs. Mm -hmm. Do I stick with what I've got or do I take your one? Because I don't know if what you give me in 30 years time gives me bowel cancer, right? Or if my one gives me bowel cancer in 30 years time. So it's a deal or no deal. You're taking a leap of faith. Right. We don't have proof yet of the long-term impacts of these bugs. So, so some it? people, I, my assumption is people who are not quite happy with their gut and have issues, yeah. they would probably take it. Yeah. People are happy, probably I'll stick. Yeah. Would you take it? I'd stick, I'm all right. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. 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 Even I'm if right. it contained all the good ones? Yeah, you know, I told you what's good, what's bad, context dependent, right? Mm. Now you mentioned bowel cancer a lot. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, it's just, it's one of these examples where there's microbiome plausible links, but it's one of these longer term things. It usually hits people older in life, right? Okay. And certainly the way the microbes um, uh, function in the gut, break down products of proteins, for example, they're known carcinogens. You know, some of them make butyrate, which is an anti-carcinogen. So the activity of your microbiota is plausibly linked to long term risk of bowel cancer, which is why I talk about it. It's a long term risk. Got it. Um, now, again, you could have an awful microbiota and never develop bowel cancer you know it's about like we all know people who smoke 60 cigarettes a day and live to 100 right mm. but it's risk right your chances might increase so and again it's one of these we are not there yet as a field i don't know what is the best microbiota right. to protect you from bowel cancer so how do i know what's in your pill you. in 30 years time isn't going to tip the balance and give me some dodgy you know what i mean absolutely so, and so but that's a personal decision and i I'd like to say i suspect people aren't happy with what they've got right now they would happily take the pill mm. i'm sure on the bowel cancer element, I can remember, I think it was maybe four or five years ago, I walked into a meeting with you and opened up, a, a, I think, a beef jerky. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, James, what are you doing? <laughs> yes. I was like, what? <laughs> it's, in, it's in my protein source. Yeah. And you were like, yeah, heavily processed, processed highly meat, processed meat. Yeah. So yeah. Is, that, is that a thing, processed meat? I, so I know we talk about nutrition science. I, was like, I get why people really get frustrated with nutrition science. In the paper, one week coffee will cure cancer, and next week coffee gives you cancer, right? <laughs> yeah. like, I get, for the general public, I get how that is yeah. super frustrating, right? Yeah. And that's science. I told yeah. you. Butter, science. margarine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Science yeah. is a long, slow process, unfortunately. It takes a lot of time to get to the truth. Yeah. Processed meat is one of the few examples where, yeah, the evidence consistently suggests that, you know, if you have a lot of it over your lifetime, your risk doesn't mean you're definitely going to get bowel cancer, but your risk, it's like smoking, right? If right. you smoke, your risk of getting lung cancer increases. So, um, so no, I think, yeah, lots of processed avoid. meat is generally not great advice for, hmm. for most people. Anything else people should avoid for their microbiome, general health? 
You know, I mean, again, it's it's a really good question. There's lots of stuff on things like modern food ingredients and ultra processed foods and stuff. You know, and um, most of that comes from rodent model studies. You know, and you know, we did um, we just been work on uh, emulsifiers, for example. It's unpublished, so I can't talk too much about it. Um, but there's lots of work in rodent models suggesting emulsifiers yeah. might destroy your gut microbiota. And, and so the one we used, which I can't talk about, it was absolutely fine. Zero impact on yeah. the microbiota, zero impact on the blood. There was no extra transfer. Of actually, it was absolutely fine. So that emulsifier is probably absolutely fine, right? So, you That's know, there's news. Yeah, no, it's That's great news. news. Yeah. So there's, there's, so again, ultra processed foods are an easy target, right? Because they're unnatural and yeah, yeah. Mm. It's, it's, you know, it's new and mm. new things are always, you know, like vaccines, whatever, they're always something yep. that people are wary of and fair enough, right? But um, again, I'm an evidence-driven man. What's the evidence? Yep. Are these things definitely going to do me mm. in? Um, yeah, and personally, again, I would avoid yeah. fructose syrups, glucose fructose yeah, syrups. I mean, there's good reasons for that even beyond your microbiome, right? They're full of calories. They put, you know, make you gain weight. If you drink like a two-litre bottle of like 100%. fizzy juice every day, it's what, 2,000 calories every day? Yeah. You know, that's your 100%. calorific allowance. Yeah. I, so I don't drink, I drink water, right? Yeah. Yep. Because it's wasted calories. I'd rather eat nice food and get fat that way. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, I think even beyond the microbiome, there's yep. just good reasons. And I think that's the nice thing about the microbiome advice that you can give is, it, as I said earlier, it ties into current mm -hmm. advice quite nicely. Mm -hmm. It just adds another mechanistic layer to mm. that. It ties in. I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I I take an even more optimistic view, which is that the, the historic health advice mm. actually was just microbiome promoting health advice. Probably, yeah. <laughs> so it's all it. Now, yeah. um, you published a what has become, I believe, quite a popular paper. Yeah. Uh, with Lindsay Hall. Yep. Uh, no, Leslie Hoyles. Sorry. Sorry. Leslie Hoyles. Back chat, back chat. Yeah. It's not Lindsay. Leslie. Oh, Leslie Hoyles, yeah. yeah. From She's Nottingham. Nottingham. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. yeah. Batch up, batch up, batch up. <laughs> but you work with Lindsay, right? Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah, right, okay. yeah, we do. Um, now, you published a, we'll, we'll let it all out, yeah. You published a uh, quite impactful and very popular paper mm -hmm. with Leslie Hoyles. Yep. And it related to myths and misconceptions yeah. within the microbiome. Yeah, yeah. So could you walk us through then some of yeah. the, the key there's ones? There's a little backstory there. So because uh, the microbiome is super interesting, super important, um, it's drawn lots of attention, which has been great, as we've talked about earlier on in the chat, but it's also brought with it a lot of hype. And, you know, I'm, I'm not big on hype. I like evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess, you know, you, I would see statements repeatedly appearing that I knew definitely were not true. And so I guess uh, I was asked to give a talk by a lady called Sheila Patrick, uh, professor at Edinburgh, um, on myths and truths in the microbiota. So I went and I sort of skewered some of the myths that I see all the time in press, which I know are not right. And it went down really well. You know, I, there was about 10 editors came after me and said, write, write a paper for us. So, really? So yeah, so I wrote the first person I asked was the nature microbiology person. So I wrote for them. Um, and really, it's just an attempt to sort of, um, one, correct the record and a few things that really annoyed us. But I guess more importantly, because some of these are trivial, it's, it's more important about just asking for slightly more credulity in microbiome research. Mm. It's very easy to get on the bandwagon and think it's going to cure everything. It's this wonder thing and it, it may cure some things. Mm. But at the moment, as we talked about, there is this vacuum. It's not there yet. So I guess it's a it's a call for a bit more critical assessment mm -hmm. and it's a correction of a few sort of pervasive myths, which yeah, actually aren't true, but are very widespread in literature. And Profiles is also a bit of a skeptic. Is that correct? Yep. 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 So it's yep. two skeptics. Yep. Yep, yep. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, Leslie wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's true. So I, I know who you're talking about. So I, I, I think, I always think skeptics are hard, but I always think I'm a realistic person, but with a Scottish edge. Because <laughs> 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 um, no, I generally do have lots of problems for the field. I'm not, I, sure. I, and honestly, I, I said for I really hate for contrarianism sure. for the sake of contrarianism. Like people sure. get to feel really clever about themselves by saying, oh, look at all those stupid scientists, what they know, they're all wrong. Right. And usually they're not, right? right. Uh, as I said, the scientific method really works but like i say there's a fine line between going too far based on mm. what the evidence will tell you so we could, could we um clear some of them up today I'm happy to yeah so what are some of the most important ones then so i mean i mean we touched on a few already to be honest so i guess we can skip through them i think the one thing that's easy to do um especially when you have a thousand papers a month is you don't have time to read all these papers it's so easy just to regurgitate a fact you know, without actually going back and searching it. So again, if you read in the literature, Joshua Lederberg invented the word microbiome. He didn't. There are 10 to the 12 bacteria per gram. There aren't. You know, it's a new field. No, it's not. We talked about it. It started mm. hundreds of years ago. So it's it's these things are just easy to repeat and parrot. You know, people mm. read them. They become lodged in their brain as dogma. They get repeated. So those are the trivial ones. We got them out of the way to show that, you know, there is a lot of mythology 
in microbiome science. So we skewered them. And um, some of the ones that are a little more important for the field are linked to the diseases that we talked about, you know, that the microbiome must be causative in every disease. Um, again, it might be, but at the moment we don't have the evidence for that. And it's been very difficult, as we talked about earlier, to disentangle cause from mm. effect. And we need a lot more mechanistic research to really get to, you know, actual plausible mechanisms which will lead us to mm. treatments eventually. With you. Um, other stuff that's in there, yeah, I guess some of it's quite techy, sciencey, nerdy stuff. You Come know. on, but um, okay, well, I'll hit you. I'll hit with a few. So, <laughs> so sequencing has been great, right? It's been amazing. We talked about DNA sequencing, and it's really revolutionised the field. It has, it has, absolutely. Um, but it's also embedded biases and artifacts. So you read quite often these are amazing technologies, and they're perfect. No technology is perfect. Everything that you use is just a technique, no matter how powerful, and they all have limitations, caveats, drawbacks. And if you're not cognizant of those, hmm. um, you make some very bad conclusions and uh, you push the field down unproductive paths. So, so um, you know, one of it was sort of, um, you know, we, we talk about um, this lack of reproducibility. When people find bug X associated with disease Y, someone repeats a study, they don't find it. The scientific method is working. But a lot of people in the meantime have jumped on that bandwagon and gone, oh, this disease must be caused by this bug and it goes nowhere, you know. So again, as I told you, science is difficult, it's tricky, it takes time. So mm. a little bit of temperance sometimes on that. Um, you know, things like um, the databases we use. So we talked about culturing and why culturing is so important. So if you, the, the, the cart's kind of ahead of the horse with sequencing at the moment. So we can generate all this data, but actually most of it ends up in the unknown pile. We don't mm. have a clue what these genes do, so we ignore it. And so really what we need to do is get back in the lab and do experiments and find out what these things are doing. <laughs> so it's kind of a, it's, it's like a plea for a bit more of that in the field. Um, and yeah, just, um, you know, some things that people used to think were true. You can't culture lots of these gut bugs. Well, you can, we you already can. have. And so things that were repeated ad nauseum actually don't have a basis in fact. So mm -hmm. just, yeah, a bit more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything diligent. else we might want to skewer? I mean, you talked about obesity earlier. Yeah, I'm trying to think about the article now. <laughs> what else do I want to skewer? It's open access, right? Yeah, no, it is, yeah, yeah. At the moment, it is, yeah, yeah. Anyone can read it, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, yeah. Read the article, I guess, yeah. is the advice. It's uh, it's in there. It's quite a short read. It's only two or three pages. It's, it's very good. Yeah, very Thank popular. You. Thank you. Good. Well, um, Alan, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for having me on. Chat, yeah. No, ha thank you for coming on. <laughs> thank you, James, for having me on your podcast. <laughs> You're welcome. No, thanks so much. Really a pleasure. Yeah. Really, really. A no, I always love having a chat. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, much. Good. Thank you. Cheers. Mm -hmm.